All right. The last time we were looking at uh, art history is we were looking at Renaissance art, and that lasted from about 1300 to 1600 AD. And um, I'm just going to do a very quick review of the uh, Renaissance art. Um, but uh, I want to remind you that Renaissance art had very stoic compositions. Uh, the lighting was lit from all over. And they had perfectly symmetrical compositions. So if we look at these two pictures, if we can draw an imaginary line right down the middle of them, it's the same on both sides. Imaginary line down the middle, it's the same on both sides. And with stoic compositions, you remember that stoic means uh, uh, very still or boring. Everybody's just kind of standing around. People are standing around here. People are just kind of standing around. There's not much movement and uh, energy in these pictures. They were very calm and they were very uh, uh, stoic. All right. Um, and then the lighting looks like it was lit from all over. It, it, it looks a lot like uh, the lighting like on a cloudy day where there's no strong shadows. Or it looks a lot like the lighting that's in a classroom where you have lots of fluorescent lights and there's no strong shadows. So we're going to begin to look at what's called Baroque art. B-A-R-O-Q-U-E is pronounced Baroque. Uh, and it lasted from about 1600 to 1700, and it mostly takes place in Europe. And the major themes of Baroque art is very theatrical. Uh, it's very dramatic. It, very, it has curvilinear forms, dramatic lighting, dynamic compositions, and religious and classical uh, content and action and movement. And I'm going to go all over all of this as we look through uh, the Baroque art. Uh, and just to give you like a comparison uh, between Renaissance and Baroque, here's a perfect uh, uh, comparison that we can make. And it, each one, each of these pictures shows exactly what the um, style kind of stood for. Here in the Renaissance, everything is just kind of very calm and um, stoic. If you draw an imaginary line down the middle, it's the same on both sides. You know, you have this arch right in the middle. And you have these uh, this one point perspective, everything kind of pointing down to right here. Um, Christ is on the cross and he's right in the middle. And on the uh, left side, there's a person standing. On the right side, there's a person standing. On the left side, there's a person kneeling. And on the right side, the per there's a person kneeling. And these columns on the left and the right are mirrors of each other. And so it makes for a very stoic composition. Uh, the other thing I want to point out is that it looks like it's kind of lit from all over. There's no real light source here. Everything is just kind of lit up the same. When you compare that to the Baroque uh, painting of the same story, this is uh, Christ being uh, uh, crucified on the cross. And this artist chose to depict the exact moment when Christ is being lifted up into the cross rather than in the renaissance he is already up on the cross so this shows the part of the story that has a lot of movement in it notice that there's a strong diagonal that goes through this picture uh, from the upper left to the lower right and then every single person in this picture is at an angle there's nobody just standing up and being still this on the right is a very dynamic composition Whereas this on the left is a very stoic composition. And also the lighting, uh, the lighting that's coming in from the right side makes for a very um, uh, dramatic difference or contrast between uh, the very light highlights and the very dark shadows. All right, and uh, to give you a couple of uh, definitions here, uh, the word stoic means very still or boring, and the word dynamic means very full of action. And the Renaissance painting is very stoic, and the Baroque painting is very dynamic. All right, so the first artist that I want to talk about with uh, Baroque art is Rubens. And he made very active and energetic compositions. Uh, he used a lot of curvilinear forms. And uh, he used the theatrical settings, and he did paintings of Rubenesque women. All right, so one of the things, uh, uh, by the way, this is not a uh, painting by Rubens. This is a painting by Hieronymus Bosch. 
But uh, I want to tell you guys about a triptych. And that's number uh, 22 on your vocabulary. <clears throat> a triptych is a three-paneled painting. So in this painting, uh, this is called the Garden of Earthly Delights. Uh, there is a painting in the center and a painting on the left and a painting on the right. Now, usually in triptychs, uh, they were meant to go up on a wall in a church and the uh, sides are on hinges and they fold in. And then as they fold in, there's a painting on the back of the sides of the side panels and it makes a fourth painting on uh, the back of those. So uh, if you go back, all right, that's what it looks like when it's open and as it closes, and that's what it looks like when it's closed. That's a triptych. All right, so here is a painting by Rubens. This is a triptych. So it has three panels. There's a panel on the left, a panel in the center, and a panel on the right. And it tells the story of, uh, it's also the crucifixion, but it's when they're taking Christ down from the cross. So uh, if we look at the, um, the panel in the middle, all right, I think we'll look at that in just a second. Before we get to that, let me just show you what it looks like in its space. So you can get a sense of how big it is. And then you can see the, uh, the triptych of it, you know, that these uh, uh, side panels are folded in a little bit. And that's what the center panel looks like. And I wanted you to notice the strong diagonal in this picture and everybody is doing something different everybody is twisted everybody is um, uh, bent over a little even these people here are slightly posed uh, so that it's not stoic like a renaissance painting that the people are all kind of moving notice the strong diagonal with the light source so from the guy's elbow through the cloth and Christ's body down to the highlights of the faces down here, it makes a strong diagonal in this picture. That's what it looks like with the um, uh, side panels. And then as the side panels close, this is what's on the back of those side panels. So here's another painting by uh, Rubens. And uh, it shows, uh, let's see, there's, baby, there's a baby down here and all the light. Notice that how dark this painting is and that the light is almost like coming from the baby. It's like a, a glowing baby or a nuclear baby. Um, but notice how er, you know, the, most of the picture is dark and there's a few bright highlights on it. And that's called tenebrism. Tenebrism is when you have a painting that is mostly dark with a few bright highlights. And that is very typical of Baroque art. And you remember how Renaissance art, everything was lit from all over. And then let's compare this to a manger scene from the Renaissance, you know, and so we have, you know, a typical Renaissance painting of the manger, you know, and if you have an imaginary line going down the middle, it divides it uh, uh, evenly on the left and the right. And the people on the left side are copied and pasted and to the right side. There's a cow, you know, a, a, a donkey and a cow that are uh, opposite each other that e balance each other out. The angels, there's two angels at the top on the left and two angels at the top on the right. And everything is nicely balanced in this. And the light is you know, even all over. There's no dramatic lighting like there is in Rubens' uh, manger scene. And there's no movement. You know, all these people in the Renaissance picture are just sitting still. But even though these people are just sitting, they're turning, they're twisting, they're, they're moving, you know, the blanket. There's angels. The angels that are up here are really twisted amongst themselves. And uh, so you can really see the difference between a uh, Baroque, manger scene and a renaissance manger scene all right so uh this painting right here is called daniel in the lion's den and uh this uh is a story taken from the bible or and so that would be called religious subject matter and the definition for a religious subject matter is art about people and stories from the bible all right uh so uh this story um is uh 
there was a law that was uh, passed that you were not allowed to pray on this particular day. And uh, Daniel was caught praying on that day. And the punishment for that law was to be sent, uh, uh, thrown into the lion's den, where most likely the lion, the hungry lions would kill you and eat you. Uh, Daniel was thrown into the lion's den and he prayed to God to save him. And God uh, saved him by sending down an angel that kept the lion's mouths shut, which meant that they didn't eat him. And uh, the next day when they opened up the pit, they found uh, Daniel there having not been eaten by a lion. So um, that's the story of Daniel in the lion's den. And if we look at a close up, uh, we can see the uh, some of the details of the lions here. But anyways, look at how all the lions are doing something different. They're, they're moving around, they're snarling, they're uh, looking at different locations. And also notice the uh, dark background and the bright highlight on Daniel. It's as if the light is just coming through that hole up in the top. All right, and we've already discussed, uh, I think we've discussed this one, or maybe we have not. All right, so this is the ascent of the cross. We, we alluded to it uh, momentarily. And here we have that, again, that strong diagonal that goes from upper left to lower right. And all the men here are struggling to uh, pull the cross up uh, so that it, it is vertical. Um, the, the strong light coming in from the right, lighting up the highlights, and they have the dark shadows in the background. The muscles on the men are very uh, prevalent with the shadows. And I think we have a, yeah, that's what it looks like in its place. That's a huge altarpiece. And it too is a triptych. There we go, that's what it looks like in the church. And there's a close-up, and you can see some of the details in the uh, painting right there. All right, do you remember David, as in David and Goliath? So Michelangelo's David was uh, this sculpture here on the left, and uh, Donatello's David was the sculpture over here on the right. Uh, we discussed these at length during uh, the, um, the Renaissance uh, presentation. And I want to show you guys... Um, Rubens David. So notice the difference of this is David uh, on Michelangelo's David is before the action. All right. So he's looking towards Goliath and he's about to have the fight with Goliath. Donatello's David is takes place after the action. So he's already had the fight with Goliath. He knocked him over. He cut off the head. So there's the head down there. He has the sword in his hand and uh, I think the rock in this other hand and here is um, Reuben's version of David and Goliath. All right, and I'm going to add a term here. It's called composition. And the definition for composition is how an artist arranges or organizes a work of art. So um, this one... Uh, Rubens has deliberately changed the positions of uh, David and Goliath to make the artwork seem more interesting. I don't think this is a realistic view of how this transpired. It doesn't seem to me to be very um, uh, efficient how David is postured. But there's some things I want to point out. This painting has a lot of, or this painting is very dynamic. You know, he's in the middle of the action. He is in the, in the middle of cutting the head off of uh, Goliath. So he's already hit him in the head. You he can see the wound on the forehead. And he's come over, he has a sword, and he's going to cut off the head of Goliath. All right, notice all the diagonals that are in the picture. So there's these diagonals. It looks like rain is in the uh, sky. And so that creates a lot of uh, diagonals from upper right to lower left. <coughs> then the sword 
is parallel to the lines that are down here. This leg right here is parallel. This arm is parallel. There's all these parallels. There's the parallel of the edge of this fabric and this fabric. There are so many lines that go from upper right to lower left, and they are woven throughout this uh, painting. Then there are other diagonals. And remember what I told you at the beginning of the year is that diagonal lines add action and movement in an artwork. All right, so another thing that I want to point out is that there is this uh, like swooping line that goes through here. It goes, you know, under Goliath's head, curves around here, goes through the leg, and then curves around the back here. And it creates this, um, this S shape through the composition. Whoops. This S shape through the composition. And that helps lead our eye around. This is not by accident. You know, the artist is moving people around to make it more visually interesting. This is not realistic. It's not practical. It's not efficient. It is artistic. The artist made certain decisions of where to place people to make it more interesting to look at. And then also there's a couple of like the, there's an oval shape right here. And there's another oval shape right here. And that's to help kind of unify things. When you have things that are kind of repeated, it helps to make it uh, more interesting to look at. All right, so that's a really good example of how an artwork is composed. All right, and another thing in uh, Ruben's artwork is the use of uh, the curvilinear form. So curvilinear uh, means curvy lines, basically um, uh, lines that curve. And here's a very good example of that. Uh, in all of these people, look at all these curving lines in their clothes, in their poses, and even in these columns right here. These columns are supposed to have straight lines, and they're broken up by these curving lines. And in the cherubs up above, there's so many curving lines in here. And it reminds me of um, uh, Lilo and Stitch. Uh, you know, when my daughters were little, we used to have a DVD of Lilo and Stitch, and it had bonus features on it. And when I watched the bonus features, it was some of the animators that were talking. And they were talking about how they tried not to have any straight lines in the, uh, in the whole movie. So when you watch the movie, you know, even things that are supposed to have a straight line, like this camera right here, all the lines are slightly curved. There's no straight lines in the the movie. And here's another. Oh, oops. Uh, here's another example. <clears throat> um, if you look at you know the post on the bed, it's all made up with straight uh, curving lines, and the uh, the foreground, the bed, all is all curving lines, even though that should be a flat edge. The poster on the wall has a slight curve to it, you know, and um, and these pictures on the wall have a slight curve to them up there. Uh, and that's what they were talking about, like not having curving line and not having any straight lines makes it more like interesting, make, gives it a sense of movement and um, and energy. So in a lot of Ruben's paintings, you can see just there's this so much movement and energy, and that's reflected by all the curving lines that are in it. All right, so let's look at this painting. This, called, this is called The Lion Hunt by Ruben's. And uh, look at how much action is in this picture. And one thing I really want to point out is his use of diagonals. Look at all like the diagonal lines in here like in the, uh, the spears that they are using and the swords and even the directional elements. Like there's this huge Nike swish right here of these horses' heads and this guy going down. And, and the, because of the, the whiteness of his clothes right here and that it's in the center and then the whiteness on this horse, it really draws your eye to the, uh, to the center of the picture. All right, because, uh, you know, it's this light area surrounded by a lot of dark areas. All right, so there's a lot of diagonals in the picture that help give the sense of movement. And then there's a lot of curves in the picture, all right, that give it a sense of uh, movement, all right. And this is what I, uh, uh, you know, when, I, when I'm talking about dynamic compositions, this is it right here. 
you know, lots of energy, lots of action, lots of stuff going on, and nobody's just standing around. Here's another one. You can see all the curves, like the curve in the back of this tiger right here, and the curve in the horse's neck, and the curve in the horse's leg right here. And there's so many diagonals and curves in this picture. It is a very well-composed and highly uh, uh, animated and full of action, a highly dynamic uh, uh, painting right here. And look at this. You know, when I look at this painting right here, I love this painting because, you know, it, the when you know when you kick over like an ant's nest and all the ants are just like uh, uh, writhing around and, and uh, moving around, this is what that looks like to me. It's like, like if these people were ants and somebody just kicked over their nest, they're all moving. There is not a single person in here that's just standing still. Uh, it's, it's a lot of movement and energy in this picture. Again, lots of movement, lots of energy, lots of people moving around. All right, guys, do you remember when we were talking, uh, when we looked at Leonardo da Vinci and we were looking at his sketchbooks and we saw this picture and I told you guys the story of Lita and the swan? All right, and she was, uh, Lita was the queen of Sparta and she was beautiful and Zeus fell in love with her and he disguised himself as a swan to hide from Hera, his wife's last sister. Um, he was pretending to be chased by a, an eagle and he laid down next to her and impregnated her. And later that night, Leda also lay down with her husband, uh, the king of Sparta. And uh, one of the children that they um, uh, had was Helen. And she was the same uh, Helen from uh, the Helen of Troy, right? That started the uh, Trojan War. All right. <clears throat> I told you the story so that uh, I could introduce this painting by Rubens. This is the story of Leda and the Swan. And this is Rubens' painting of Leda with the Swan. Um, and I also want you to notice uh, what's going on uh, with her with her body. All right, so uh, Rubens has a habit of making his women kind of large. All right. And that is called, uh, there's a name for it, and it's called Rubenesque. So women that are painted large by Rubens uh, have gained this name of Rubenesque. And, and Rubenesque is now a term that it's a very like nice way of saying that a woman is large. You know, they say she's not fat or she's not big. She's Rubenesque. It's a compliment, not an insult. And um, this is the dictionary definition. But the definition I want you guys to write down is basically large women painted by Rubens. All right. So, uh more to the story. So in Sparta, Queen Leda, the same queen as that. So that's Queen Leda right there with the swan. All right. So there's Queen Leda. And so uh, she had sex with Zeus, who was disguised as a swan. And she also had sex with her husband, King uh, Tyndarius. And he was also a general in the army. So that's why I chose that icon. All right. So they had children from that coupling. So uh, Helen, uh, uh, was born and also these two twins, uh, Pollux and Castor. Now Pollux was the son of Zeus from that swan and Castor was the son of Tyndarius, the king. All right, but they're twins, but have different fathers. Uh, Helen grew up to be the Helen of uh, Troy, the Helen that started the Trojan War and ended with the Trojan horse. That's why I included that horse icon right there. But these two twins, Castor and Pollux, grew up, and uh, they became, you know, in, in another story, they became Gemini. So, you know, the signs of the Zodiac, and one of those is Gemini. Well, that's these two kids right here. All right, over in another town, the other town of Messina, uh, Aphareus was the brother of Tyndarius, and Aphareus had a couple of twins. And uh, those are the twin sons of Aphareus. And then there was a pair of twin girls who were betrothed to marry the twin sons of Aphareus. And these twin girls were the daughters of King Leucippus. 
So they were all arranged to get married, but the twins of Zeus and Tyndareus, uh, these two guys, Castor and Pollux, they were in love with the twin daughters of Leucippus. And what they did is they kidnapped those daughters and took them away to Sparta and married them and uh, had children with them. All right. So okay, so this is Ruben's painting of that account. The title of this picture is called The Rape of the Daughters of Leucippus. And let me just go ahead and define the word rape for you. Uh, in this case, uh, rape means kidnapping or abduction. And when I looked up this painting on Wikipedia, it discussed the meaning of this word. And uh, here's what Wikipedia says. The word rape in the conventional translation of the Latin word raptio, which means the abduction or kidnapping. It is used in the ancient counts of this incident. So that means that when uh, this, uh, uh, when the ancient stories of this, they use the word uh, rape as it meant then, not now. So like now, rape means a sexual assault, but back then it meant a kidnapping. Um, modern scholars tend to interpret the word as abduction or kidnapping as opposed to a sexual assault. And uh, controversy remains, however. So that controversy means that some people think that these women are being sexually assaulted uh, and some people think that they're being kidnapped. I think they're being, uh, they're, they're being uh, kidnapped. Because uh, that's what the story uh, tells. <clears throat> and uh, so here we have, um, and, and I know that the women like are, are not clothed and they're being roughly handled by the guys, but this is a painting of a kidnapping because I find it hard to believe that this painting would be in uh, museums for hundreds of years uh, if, this, if this were a picture of uh, sexual assault and not kidnapping. All right, so let's identify the people that are in here. That guy right there is uh, Castor. He's the son of uh, Tyndareus, the, um, the king. And he was a, a metalsmith. He made armor, so that's why he's wearing armor. Also, notice that his, there's two horses in this picture. One horse is calm, and the other horse is going wild. Castor was known for uh, taming horses, so that's why his horse is calm. Uh, the other guy without a shirt is Pollux. He's the son of Zeus. He was the uh, uh, he was um, his father was disguised as a swan uh, uh, during the inception conception. All right, and then uh, Hilaria, sorry, Hilara is uh, that woman there, and then that is Phoebe. All right, so that, I love this painting, and the reason why I love this painting so much is the composition of it. I think it is a genius composition. Uh, so one thing you might notice is that there is a dividing line between this uh, between in this picture. Uh, notice that um, uh, usually there's a dividing line in a work of art that goes vertically down the middle. But in this case, it is a diagonal dividing line. And uh, you can see that there's like this just little bit of space between the two women right there. And uh, that's from that dividing line. Then notice all the uh, lines coming out. It almost looks like a, like a wagon wheel, the way that all these lines are coming out uh, from the center of the picture. And then I want you to notice that there are these like rounded shapes going around and it really does control the eye as it moves around. And once again, this really does give me the uh, I'm reminded of a wagon wheel uh, where these uh, spokes are coming from the middle and then it, it goes around in a circle around the outer edge. A brilliant piece of composition in this painting. Oh, and then I found this joke. Uh, the husband and the wife were in marriage counseling. The uh, therapist uh, showed this picture to the husband and asked him what he thought of it. And he answered, it, it looks like two husbands trying to teach their wives how to ride horses. <laughs> and I thought that was funny. All right. Oh, and this right here, uh, this will take us to a video where it shows a woman painting this picture. So it's 
a sped up uh, image and um, it, it kind of just shows you how a painting is made. So first she kind of just layered in lightly and then she's adding some color. All right, that's it for today. And until next time, be a little art factory.